I thank you, God. I thank you, God. I thank you for being my God. Thank you, Jesus. As I was getting ready to, uh, to come here, God began to just pour out to me about some of the things that you guys are going through on a daily basis. And I sat there and I'm just like, wow. These are some really strong teenagers. To go through some of the things that they're going through. And as I would watch you guys in worship, and it was interesting because some of you guys had a, 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 like a, a stone cold face on. And I'm like, man, how are they so serious when, when this is what the Lord has shown me is going on in their life? So today I'm hoping that we can break down some of these barriers and break down some of these walls that are set up in your life because I know what it's like to be a teenager and have that. I know what it's like to come in and have to put on a straight face because if I tell somebody, somebody might not get it. Somebody might misunderstand what I'm trying to say to them. And when I'm crying out for help, somebody might get me in trouble. I know what it's like to feel like that, to not have anybody to talk to. I know what it's like. I'm not too far uh, from you guys' age. So, so just stay with me as we, we preach the word today. I was thinking about preaching about David because as you look on this board here, you see peer pressure, David faced that. Cyberbullying, David faced that. Self-esteem, David faced that. Anxiety, David faced that. But as I was going to prepare to speak about David tonight and tell you about David, the Lord kind of like disrupted all of my plans. He said, I want you to talk about a man named Samson. I want you to talk about a man named Samson. So tonight we're going to be reading in Judges 14. If you have your Bibles, open up the Judges 14 and just hold it there. If you don't have a Bible, pull out a phone, pull out a tablet, borrow somebody's computer, do something. But pull out the word if you have it. So, tonight, the sermon title that, that God would have me speak on is this. Take your hands off my anointing. Somebody say that. Take your hands, Take your hands off, off my, anointing. my anointing. Say it like you're actually talking to somebody and you really want them to take their hands off. Take your hands, Take your hands off, off my anointing. I want you guys just to, to, to come make a declaration with me. It's really short. I want you to say that I am anointed. I was created with a purpose. And my purpose is to glorify God. I am anointed. I was created with a purpose. And my purpose is to glorify God. What if I were to tell you? That within you lies purpose. That within you lies the, the potential to be greater than you can possibly imagine. That when God began to knit the very fabric of who you are, he decided that you would have a gifting, that you would have a purpose, that you would have an anointing. And when that purpose is lived out that would bring honor and glory to God and cause you to operate at your best. You know Pablo Picasso, he's a famous artist and he once said that the meaning of life, are you hearing me? The meaning of life is to find your gift and the purpose in life is to give it away. And it would take a fool to walk in this room and not notice the world changers sitting in these seats. It would take a fool to not notice the lawyers that are sitting here, the doctors that are sitting here, the judges that are sitting here, the politicians, the CEOs, the corporate execs that are in this room, the professional athletes that are in this room, and the preachers that are in this room that will shake the earth. But what I promise you is that you'll never operate in this calling if you remain defiant. To what God is calling you to do. And if you are defiant and somehow manage to redirect 
yourself back to God later on in life, it's going to already have cost you dearly. What do I mean by defying? What I mean by defying is walking around knowing that God has gifted you and called you to live for Him right now. But saying in your heart that you'll get to it when you're a little bit older. Or thinking for some reason that you can do things on your own and end up fine. But I tell you right now that the devil is a liar. Why? Because defiance is simply an opening for what I would like to call purpose blockers. And purpose blockers are spiritual forces that come to steal, they come to kill, and they come to destroy your purpose. Like anxiety, things like anxiety, things like depression, things like fear, things like hurt or trauma, pain, and confusion. See, I'm not so far removed from my teenage years to remember that you guys deal with some crazy, rough stuff every single day. I remember kids in my school who popped pills and did and sold all kinds of drugs. Uh, kids who loved to fight and would nearly kill you if they had the chance in a fight. People who had STDs in school, in high school, and spread them in high school. Miscarriages, abortions in high school, and other things that people ages 13 through 19 should not have to deal with every day. But what if I told you that it doesn't have to be that rough? It doesn't have to be that tough. It doesn't have to be that hard. What if I told you that the purpose that God has given you could cause you to not only change your environment, but change the environment of the people around you. See, you came tonight for a youth encounter. And I believe you're going to encounter God tonight. That's my sincerest belief that you are going to encounter God tonight. I believe that God is going to set some of you free from some of the things that you are going through and that you won't even speak about. See, I tell you right now that God sees your situation. You sitting right there, he sees your situation and has seen your situation. And he's issued a command to the spiritual forces that are weighing you down. And you know what he says? He says, get your hands off of my anointed. You are his anointed. And I wish somebody in this room would echo that command with me and tell the enemy, get your hands off of my anointing. Let us pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come to you right now, Lord God, and we thank you for being God, for being who you are, knowing exactly who we are, knowing that we mess up at times, Lord God, knowing that we, we hurt your heart, Lord God, that we break your heart, Lord God, knowing that we sin against you, and yet you still, you still, you still reach out to us, Lord God. I thank you, Lord God, for bridging the gap, Lord God. I thank you, Lord God, for reaching us when we weren't even reaching out to you, Lord God. I thank you for who you are, for who you are is sovereign, Lord God. And I thank you, Jesus, for knowing our hearts, Lord God, for knowing us well, for knowing the very number of hairs on our head, Lord God. You are the God who can separate the east from the west, Lord God. You are the God who can pull the north away from the south, Lord God, where we don't even know where that line is, Lord God. But you know it, Lord God. You know it. You are the God who stops the sea at the sand, Lord God. You're all powerful. You know all, Lord God, can do all, and nothing can stop you, Lord God. And we thank you. We thank you, Lord God, for being God in our lives. And tonight, Lord God, where things would try to rise up like depression, uh, self-esteem issues, insecurities, Lord God, feelings of abandonment, rejection, Lord God, self-abuse, those things would try to rise up and mount up, but we cancel their assignment right now in the name of Jesus, and we cast them down right now in the name of Jesus. Devil, you, you have no place in here in the name of Jesus. So we ask right now, Lord God, that your fire would fall in this room. That the fire of the Holy Spirit would penetrate the hearts of each person here, Lord God. And while they came in with barriers and blockages, Lord God, you would set them free. Lord God, you have issued 
a command in the season, Lord God, for release, Lord God. You said, in, in, you told me to release the captives, to release your anointing, to release your kingdom. So we release it now in the name of Jesus. Devil, you have to flee at the name of Jesus. So in the name of Jesus, we say, amen. See, tonight we're going to look at the, the life of a man. And this man's name is Samson. And you know what? Samson was crazy anointed, right? So he was anointed by God at birth. He was a ladies' man. If you read the word, he was a ladies' man. He was a, he was a super strong. He was a mighty warrior and a deliverer. But the thing that stood out to me about Samson was that his life was filled with so much drama. See, I mean, he had some serious issues. He had relationship problems. He had anger issues. He had lust. And, and I would dare to say even insecurities that drove him to do things in ways that were defiant to the laws that God had given Israel. You see, before Samson came into the picture, his mother couldn't have children. But God sent the angel of the Lord to tell her that she would have a son and that her son would, be, would set the Israelites free from the Philistines who have been oppressing them for over 40 years. See, but in order to, to do this, this boy named Samson, he would have to live his entire life as a Nazarite. Does anyone know what a Nazarite is? He would have to live his life as a Nazarite, meaning that he couldn't do things like eat grapes, he couldn't drink wine, he couldn't touch dead bodies, or even like cut his hair. So that fresh edge up that, that y'all have, and it's, oh, he couldn't do that. that. That was something he couldn't do. You see, we would say Samson was called to live a consecrated life, which basically means that he was set apart from everybody else to be used for God's purpose. He was set apart. And the best way I can kind of describe it, anybody an athlete in here? Your athlete, athletes, hands go up for the athletes. Can y'all clap for y'all athletes in the room? Because that training is rough. I used to be an athlete, but I've been eating. I've been eating a whole bunch, and I can't do the things that I used to do anymore. Y'all pray for me. But the best way I can describe it um, is, is, is like when a person wants to become a professional athlete, they don't eat Pop-Tarts. And m and every day. They don't do that because they need to be in great shape so that when they hit the field, they are operating at their physical and their mental and their mentally their best. See, Samson had to be set apart so that he could do what God was calling him to do, which was fight and defeat Philistines. That was his purpose. That's what was, was his life mission. But Samson was defiant and he had a knack for thinking that he can do things his own way. Which leads me to my first point. But before we get to my point, let's read the scripture. And this is in Judges 14. We're going to read verse 1 through 4. Are you with me? I heard somebody say son. Are you with me? Yeah. Are you with me? If everybody says yes, I can move on. Yeah, yeah let's, get this, let's get this going. All right, all right. So Samson went down to Timnah. Somebody say Timnah. I need you to respond back to me. We're going to be here for a while. Do I, hear, do I hear any more timbers? Samson went down to Timnah. That's what I'm talking about. And at Timnah, he saw one of the daughters of the Philistines. Then he came up and told his father and mother. He said, I saw one of the daughters of the Philistines at Timnah. Timnah. That's where he's seen her. Now get her for me as a wife. But his father and mother said to him, is there not a woman among the daughters of your relatives or among all the people that you must go take a wife from uncircumcised Philistines? But Samson said to his father, get her for me, for she is right in my eyes. My first point is this. The forbidden place ain't for you. The forbidden place ain't for you. You see, I don't think y'all read what I just read, so I'm going to uh, explain it a little bit. Is that okay with you? See, first of all, Samson heads down to Timnah, and the name Timnah actually means the forbidden place. And while he's where he shouldn't be at in this forbidden place, 
He sees a girl, and this girl is fine. I mean, I might have to say it in y'all context, because I'm a little bit older than y'all, but she's a baddie, bro. You know what I'm saying? She's a baddie. So, so what happens next is that Samson runs up to his parents, and he tells them that he was in the forbidden place. He tells his parents, yo, look, I was in the forbidden place, and I seen this girl, and she's a baddie, so, um... Why don't you get this girl to marry me? Why don't you have her marry me? And his parents are basically like, bruh, you sure you want to do that? I mean, she's not even saved. She, she don't go to church. Like, don't you want a good, like, synagogue-loving girl? Like, don't you want little, little Ethel over here? Don't you want little Ethel? No, you don't want little Ethel? You want, you want Cardi B up in Timna? <laughs> and this is basically what's happening. Sam is, Samson's like, but she's bad though. That was his that was his reasoning. He was like, but she's bad. Um so I'm gonna need y'all to make this happen. And that's what he said to his parents. I need you to make this happen. Now, but see what, what got me about all of this, right, is that Samson's mama couldn't have been my mama. She could not have been my mom, and I'm gonna tell you why. Because the moment I told my mom I was in the forbidden place, it would have been like, <laughs> I would have been punched like at least three or four times, and I would have been watching, I'd have been watching my own funeral with Jesus. Like me and Jesus would have had a front row seat to my own funeral. And I'd have been standing there with all my teeth knocked out. Like my mom would have been like, You went who? You went to go see who? And where? The forbidden place? Nah, 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 nah. So that wasn't my life. No. But the reality of it all was that Samson was in a place that he shouldn't have been. This place was forbidden. And while he was there, something caught his eye in the forbidden place. And now, Samson is, he's drawn to it. The thing that caught his eye in the forbidden place, this woman. But this is what the devil does. I want to explain this to you because I feel like at this age, if you were to grasp what I'm saying tonight... It'll actually aid you and assist you in life for the rest of your life. You see, James 1.15 says this, that desire leads to sin and sin leads to death. Hear that. Desire leads to sin and sin leads to death. And guess what? The devil is still out here doing the same thing, leading people down the wrong path by catching their eye with desire. You know, he did that in Genesis. You don't even got to look that far. Turn to Genesis 3 when you get a chance at home and you'll see it. In Genesis it says that Eve seen the fruit and desired it. She ate it and sinned and then was condemned to death. And now we have Samson willing to defy all of Judaism to get a girl who's an enemy. Why? He says at the end of verse 3, he says, get her for me for she is right in my eyes. But if you were to look at other translations, it would say, get her for me because she pleases me. She pleases me. Not because she was working on her, her PhD, not or her MBA, not because she's an enemy Philistine, but somehow like loves the Lord in her spare time, but, but simply because she pleased him. He desired her. And what I got to tell you right now is that one moment of pleasure, catch this, one moment of pleasure is not risking your eternity in hell. One moment of pleasure is not risk you worth it, uh, risking, is not worth you risking your, your eternity in hell. You see, I don't need you to contemplate, uh, see, what I do need you to do is I need you to contemplate this, this idea when you're in the midst of your timna, when you're in the midst of that forbidden place, when you're in front of your computer screen or your phone heading into a place that's forbidden. You know what I mean. When you're deciding to sneak that boy or that girl over your school, a after school, before your parents get home, when you're about to cheat on that test, when you're about to go out and vape with your friends, is it worth you losing your soul over. You see, it's in this decision-making process that you can actually spare yourself from anxiety, from depression, from hurt and abuse that comes with making the wrong decisions. But you know what? 
Maybe you have made the wrong decision. And maybe you're not deciding to head back to Timna, this forbidden place, for the first time. Maybe you've been there before. Maybe, maybe you're, you've messed up and you're set back on going to this forbidden place to do what you're not supposed to be doing. And what I gotta tell you right now is stop. Stop. Stop going to the forbidden place. And it's just that simple, stop. Because what lies ahead is determined to take you out. I want you to look at what happens to Samson next in verse four through six. It says his father and mother did not know that it was from the Lord, for he was seeking an opportunity against the Philistines. At that time, the Philistines ruled over Israel. Verse 5. Then Samson went down with his father and mother to Timnah, and it came to the vineyards of Timnah. And behold, a young lion came roaring towards him. Then the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon him, and although he had nothing in his hands, he tore the lion in pieces as one could tear a young goat. But he did not tell his father or his mother what he had done. This man just tore apart a lion. Tore apart a lion. One thing that gets me about this is that verse 4 basically says, right, that Samson's journey to Timnah was of the Lord. You see, your purpose and your anointing, this is what I want to clarify to you, that your purpose and your anointing are linked. And God knew that this girl would catch Samson's eye and that Samson would go into Philistine territory to get her. Why? Because the Lord was You see, Samson's purpose in life was to free Israel from the Philistines. That was his purpose. That's what God anointed him to do. But what this verse doesn't say, though, is that God planned for Samson to do it in this manner. His decision to go to Timnah wasn't based off the desire to glorify God. He wanted to go there because of the pleasure that he would get from that girl that he liked. But now, a lion comes along. And this lion attacks Samson. And Samson tears that lion to shreds. So you now you might get hyped listening to this like, oh, okay, then Mr. Allen, well, Samson won. He, he, he wrestled the lion and he tore it apart. What's the problem? The problem is, is that the lion was simply a battle that Samson did not have to fight. It wasn't a battle that he should have been fighting in the first place. Just because you want to fight, does it mean that you have the right to be in it? See, as teenagers, y'all go through stuff that your parents may never know about. Y'all go through stuff like pregnancy scares, like horrendous gossip, and all kinds of craziness that is set on assignment to break you. But just because you came out without damage associated with these things, doesn't mean that you were meant to go through it. See, this is why verse 6 ends stating, but he did not tell his father or his mother what he had done. Who fights a lion barehanded, tears it apart, and doesn't tell anybody about it? Who does that? Samson does that. Why? Why does Samson not tell anybody about it? Because he was possibly ashamed. The same reason that you might not tell your parents about what's it says, for the mystery of iniquity is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he's taken out of the way. And this is the mystery of iniquity. The Greek words for this are mysterion. Give you a little Greek today. The, the word for mystery is mysterion, which means secret. And anomai is 